Uh, sounds good. All right. So our speaker for tonight is none other than Jordan Levine. Jordan is a CSS engineer and creative front end developer living in Denver, Colorado and working at Universe Exploration Company. Her background in teaching code and art gives her a unique perspective and ability to solve and explain complex problems in a clear way. She loves everything to do with CSS and rubber duck debugging. Jordan is going to be presenting on CSS animation. So Jordan, passing it off to you. All right, sounds good. I think I'm sharing the correct screen here. Um, cool. So hello, I am Jordan and I like everything CSS. So I decided to come hang out and chat uh, animation with everyone tonight. Um, yeah. Uh, so before we get into how to do all the different animations and stuff like that, uh, I always like to have a clear idea of why I would want to do the thing. Otherwise, when I've just tried adding animations all over the place, um, it tends to just get overcrowded and it doesn't look very well, very good in general. Um, and it just kind of becomes a mess. Um, so it's really nice to kind of focus in on some reasons why you might want to do animation. Um, so the material design documents talk about uh, some principles behind it. And the first one is being informative. Um, so you can use motion design animation to kind of inform your user. They, you can show them relationships between different elements, what actions are available, um, cause and effect, like if you're sending a form, um, and just generally providing feedback. Uh, you can also help to focus your user to get them to pay attention to what's the important thing that you actually want them to be doing uh, with small animations. Um, use that to also guide them through, like if you have multi-steps, like a multi-step form or something like that, you can use it to kind of just guide them through in the correct path. Uh, you can also use it to be expressive. Um, so you can use it to celebrate moments of joy in the user's journey. Um, so just kind of add delight to your site, uh, make it more interesting. It can help express the brand style, your own style, um, and just give a, a little bit of fun to the site. Um, so with all of that in mind, you should pay, there's, so you can do animations in CSS or you can do them in JavaScript, but either way, you really need to pay attention to what elements and what uh, attributes you're actually animating, because the more you add on, especially once you start going into JavaScript animations, uh, you really have to worry about browser performance. So when you take a look at how browsers render, um, they kind of go through this pipeline where they start off by doing these style calculations, which is basically the way the browser figures out which CSS rules should apply to what elements on the page. So this is when it's gonna go through the cascade and figure out like what has priority or specificity over other, other uh, properties and figure out exactly which things will go on which elements. Uh, then, then the browser starts figuring out layout um, which is when it actually calculates how much space an element will need. So what size it's going to be, how tall it's going to be, uh, and things like that. And so it starts calculating. So if you used any of the calc functions or if you're doing percentages or things like that, it starts figuring out what that actually is going to be rendered on the screen. Uh, next, you go into the paint section of the pipeline, um, which is kind of two steps. But first, it goes through and it fills in basically all the pixels. So it'll actually kind of draw the text, the colors, the images, borders, shadows, any of those type of features, and put them all on layers. Um, all of this happens, and you won't actually see anything show up on the screen. Um, you kind of start to see stuff in paint. That's why a lot of times browsers will talk about like time to first paint. Um, but it doesn't really come together until you get to this composite layer. 
um, which is when it puts all the layers on the page and kind of stacks them in the right order so that nothing is behind things unless it's supposed to be um, and make sure that they do get stacked in the right order if they are. Um, so when you are working on animation, you want to try to stay as kind of far down this pipeline as you can. The, the closer you are to things like the composite layer or even the paint layer means that the browser has to do less work to make all those changes. Um, the less work the browser does, the smoother it'll look for your user and the less of an impact it'll have when you're trying to cut down on site size. Um, so you wanna try to stay there as much as possible. Um, so some properties that are handled by the composite layer which kind of is where you want to stick. Um, and it doesn't, when I when I list them out like this, it's going to be like there's almost nothing there. But you can actually do a whole lot with it. You just have to get creative. Um, but you can change the position. So you don't want to use like position absolute and move it around by changing your top or left or right uh, like that. You want to use the transform and translate, which allows you to move things in your x and y axes. Um, but this keeps it at that composition composition layer instead of at the layout layer. If you do the like top left or top whatever pixels and you move it that way, it goes all the way up to that layers level and has to do a whole bunch of re-rendering to get going. Um, you can also use change scale. Uh, so again, instead of changing the like height and width of an object, you should change the scale using transform. Um, which allows you to kind of uh, bump an item up or down in size. Uh, you can use rotation, so uh, basically lets you spin things around. Um, also using the transform, there's a little bit of a theme there. Um, you get to skew, uh, which is sort of like the rotate, but it kind of it 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 tends to warp how the object is shaped a little bit. Um, and we can take a look at some of these to see how they work well. Um, and then the last one that you should work with is the opacity. So this will, rather than doing like display none and then trying to bring an element in, you want to have the element there but invisible. So you'll set your opacity to zero. And then you might animate slowly at coming into like that opacity one uh, so that it is visible and you can see it. Um, and I will share all these the link to these slides and stuff as well. So you guys have access to that. And then I've linked some different articles at the bottom um, that kind of go into it a little bit more. Um, another thing you can do to try to keep your animations as optimized as possible is you can promote elements, which basically you're telling it, I'm going to do some animation on this. So browser, when you render this, put it on its own layer. Um, some Because a lot of times the browser will try to put things on the same layers because it saves memory for the browser. Uh, but doing this is you telling the browser like, hey, this is going to change, so leave it by itself. Uh, and you don't want to go overboard with any of this. The more layers you create by doing this code here, this will change transform. Uh, you know, it's going to slow down the browser. So use it when it makes sense, when you do have elements that you are animating, but don't go crazy with it because it all adds up eventually. Cool. So we get a whole bunch of different properties for animation that we basically just put together to make these different animations. So the first one that I want to take a look at is this at keyframes rule, um, which is basically used to define the keyframes along the animation sequence. So you can start with a really basic animation that goes from something to something, um, which might look something like this. So I'm saying rotate this thing, start at zero, and rotate it 45 degrees. Um, but you can get more complicated. You can do this by percentages. So you could say at you know 10% be at 45 degrees, but at 70% you should be at like 
200 degrees. So it'll rotate at different rates depending on how you set it um, using those either keywords or percentages. Um, so this is kind of just the basic way you set it up like that. Uh, so then you have to link that at keyframes that you just defined to the element that you actually want to animate. Uh, so we do this with the animation name property and we just match the name. So like here, this one is called animation set. Um, so we would match it by just saying the animation name is animation set. Uh, not really one because I got rid of the one, but anyway, close enough, gives you the idea. Um, so we can take a look here. And so I've created, uh, and I do link to this from the slides, the little code button down here would take you to this um, code pen as well. Um, so I just have a whole bunch of divs um, and each one has their own little box that we're gonna animate. So for this first one, uh, is this text okay for people to read or is it too small? Sometimes my computer gets too small. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> cool. Um, so basically we've defined this keyframe set, um, which is that same rotation that we were looking at a second ago. And we've told it to animate using that name. Um, but it doesn't look like a whole lot's happening since we haven't actually given it enough information. Uh, so let's go back to the slides for a second. And the next one to look at is the duration because uh, it knows it wants to animate it, but we haven't given it a defined amount of time to do the animation. So it's doing the animation instantly, which means that we don't see it. <laughs> so we can change the animation duration, which is how long it takes to complete a single cycle. Uh, and that generally just looks like this. Uh, you can set it using like seconds, milliseconds, whatever is your go-to. Uh, so if we come back and we look at the second one, it has the animation duration set. So that's right here. And now when you hover over it, it does the animation. Uh, it's kind of weird because it snaps right back to its initial positioning, um, but at least we're getting it to move. Um, and we can change this. You know, it's at half a second. We can change it to two seconds. It'll do some fun flashing. We'll scroll back down. Um, and now it's going a little bit slower. So the next property we get is the delay. Um, so I did these with hovers so that I can trigger them easily, but sometimes you don't want it just to be on a hover. You want it to happen when the page loads, but you don't want everything to happen right away. So you might add a delay so that it takes a second or two before um, it starts moving around. So sometimes I'll use this on like forms where I'll wait and I'll delay for like two seconds. And if the user hasn't interacted with an with the next element for two seconds, then I'll do like a little shake on it to get their attention. Like you're supposed to be over here. Um, so on animation three, I've added in a delay. So this one, when I hover over it, will wait half a second before it does the little twist. Um, and all of these work with, with or without hover. I just did it to trigger it easy in this case. That's the code again there. Um, so if you've worked with animation before, or have read about it and things like that. They always talk about how objects don't always move at the exact same speed. <laughs> so we get these animation timing functions, um, which gets a little mathy on you, uh, but basically sets acceleration curves, changes the speed that the object moves at throughout the animation. Um, so there's a whole bunch of keywords for this. There's ease in, which starts slower and then finishes fast. You can do ease out, which does the opposite. It starts fast and then slows down. Um, you can do linear, which is the default, and it'll move at all one speed the whole time. 
Um, so there's a whole bunch that you can play with. And we'll take a look at our fourth block here. Um, so I have on this fourth block, uh, two different divs. So the one on the left with the is set to, to ease in, and the one on the right is set to ease out. So the one that's going to ease in is going to start slow and finish fast, and the other one's going to start fast and finish slow. So when I trigger them both, you can see that they're, they take the same amount of time to do the animation, but they're kind of working at different speeds. Um, so I'll use these ease in and out a lot when I'm bringing an element into the screen, because maybe I want it to kind of, you know, start slowly creeping in and then like kind of end with that um, motion there um, so that you can kind of play with that. Uh, you can get real mathy with it and start doing like cosine and sine and all of that stuff that I don't remember from high school math um, to get real specific with it. Uh, and there's definitely uh, resources online that you can find that will help you write those functions if you want something other than the keywords. Uh, so one thing that you may have noticed so far is that all of our animations reset all of a sudden, like dramatically and a little awkwardly as soon as they finish their loop. Uh, so we can use something called the animation fill mode, which allows us to set styles to the element before or after the animation. Uh, so we can do, in this case, I'm using forwards. So I want to animate an element, but keep it how it is at the end. So let it move forward through the steps. Uh, you can set it backwards and have it reset to um, the beginning state at the end. And you can set it with both, which means that it can match the element not based on what you told the element to be, but what you told the animation to be, uh, which is a little funky, but. Um, so if we come down here to five, uh, these ones just stop and they stay here in this end state because uh, I've set the uh, fill mode to forwards. If we do both, um, it's going to look the same. There we go. Because our initial animation starts at rotate zero, which this element already is, um, we could change it so that it starts at 45 degrees and goes to 90, um, which is weird because, so like this one on four, where we didn't set the fill mode, when you start to hover, it automatically jumps to that 45 <laughs> starting point and then rotates the rest of the way. Um, but here, if I did it right, um, it shouldn't do that. It is, but it shouldn't. <laughs> um, I'm not totally sure why. Uh, it probably has a lot to do with having too many pieces on this page. Um, but generally, it should start it at code pen's also weird sometimes because of how it goes, but I'm going to have to play with that and figure out why it's not working. And I will figure that out at some point, but I don't want to get stuck here for too long. But at least leaving it at four words um, kind of ends you in that one spot so that it doesn't jump back at the end. I'm going to reset that. That's always nice when you're moving an element onto the page uh, that it actually stays where you put it. Um, and then you can do things so that like if it loses focus or it loses hover, it'll reset, um, which is kind of what this one does for now. So the next one is the animation iteration count, the next property. 
And with this one, it allows us to repeat an animation however many times we want it to go. So you can give it a number, you can tell it to repeat twice, or you can tell it to repeat infinite number of times, in which case it'll just keep repeating whatever that animation is over and over again. So for that one, we're down to six. Um, and so it'll kind of do that animation that it flips back to start over again at the beginning, um, which is maybe not exactly the functionality we want, uh, but at least it's kind of becoming this ongoing animation. Uh, so if we take a look at this next one, which is the direction, uh, we can add this one in. And this one allows us to define if the animation plays forwards or backwards. Uh, so by default, it plays forward. So it goes from and then to, or from 0% to 100%. But you can change it to be reverse so that it goes from 100% to 0% or in these alternating cycles so that it goes forwards and then backwards. So instead of having that jerk back to the beginning, it kind of just flows in both directions. Um, so when we combine that infinite count with alternate directions, we come down to seven and it'll just, And it's a little bit nicer now. <laughs> um, so as you can see, these kind of like all build on each other and you start adding more in to get more functionality and kind of make it behave the way that you want it to go. And so we're getting close to the end of the ones that we have, but you also get this uh, play state property which you can combine with uh, buttons and things like that to trigger it so that you can pause the animation at any point in the sequence. So for this one, I have set it to just automatically go. So this is for eight. Um, so it's automatically just going back and forth as many times as infinite. Um, but on hover, it'll pause. So wherever it is in the cycle, it pauses when you hover over it. Um, I've seen that with buttons a lot so that you can like trigger the animation. Like if you click here, then something else will play. Um, so it's kind of fun to do that or just kind of freezing things or starting them as you hover over it. Um, so that's... I think, yeah, that's all of the different um, properties you have. And I generally like to define them each out uh, because you can put them all together, but it becomes this kind of mess. So you can say like animation, three seconds, ease in, out, five seconds, infinite, alternate, animation set, but that's hard to read. <laughs> um, like. Is the three seconds the duration or the pause or like the delay? Like, what is it referring to? I always get confused. So I pretty much always will define them all um, separately, uh, but you can technically do this. And other than the fact that the duration has to be before the delay, the order of the rest of it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, <laughs> which makes it even more confusing. Um, but I did this last one, um, which is basically the same as eight, just a little slower as a single thing. So we're defining the duration, what easing function we want to use, the delay. So this one doesn't start until it's been on the page for five seconds. Um, to repeat an infinite amount of times, that's our iteration count, uh, to alternate directions. And this is the keyframe set I want to match. Um, it's good to know that that exists uh, so that when you see other people do it, you can kind of figure it out. But I find it frustrating to use. <laughs> so these are all the different um, properties you have to animate, and we can go back and see the different things that you can change. 
Um, so changing again, the position, the size, uh, how it's rotated, um, if it's kind of skewed at different angles and its opacity, um, which again, isn't a lot, but you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, I tend to use color a lot as well in my animations, even though it's not one of these, um, cause it's not too bad. Cause that just goes back to the paint level, uh, not the layout. So it's not too bad to do color as long as you're not going crazy with it. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about Hacktober um, and I don't know if uh, y'all have seen our Scrollodex project. Uh, I've got it running here. If the Zoom gets out of my way, it doesn't like to let me change tabs. There we go. Um, so I've got it running and it looks something like this. Uh, we're basically a bunch of people have come in and we've added our own business cards to this project. So I was thinking about some fun animations that you could try and add to your card if you already have one, or if you're making a new card that you could add to it uh, to have some fun with it. Uh, so the first one I came up with was changing the background color or gradient on your card. Uh, this is something I did last year. So you can see the background on this Jordan Levine card kind of flows through this gradient. <laughs> Um, and it's just kind of like a fun little animation in the background. Uh, so that looks something like this, where I have basically defined a linear gradient as my background and made it really big. And then I use this um, keyframes to move it across so that different pieces are showing. Um, I have another code pen here, which is linked up at the top, uh, which kind of pulls that code out from everything else in the project. So you can see it a little bit easier uh, and play with it. So this one's on a five second instead of 15, which is what it is in the project right now. Um, and I did a whole bunch of rainbow colors, uh, but you can play with this and do different types of gradients, change the colors that you're using, uh, maybe play with the different percentages, make it go um, faster or slower at different points um, to kind of play with that a little bit and have fun. Um, and especially when it's at like a 15 second thing, it's pretty subtle and not super in your face obvious, but a fun little detail to add to your card. Um, the next one I was having fun playing with was image filters. Since we all put pictures up with our card, um, you get these CSS image filters that you can play with. Um, so in this case, I am changing, I'm using the hue rotate, which when we go and look at the demo, uh, it's hard to tell on all the pictures, but it's kind of doing some funky party colors because it's, just rotating around um, how it displays the colors. Uh, so doing something like this and you can set it uh, here. I just did the one, zero and 100, but you could do to and from or from and to uh, and things like that um, to kind of have fun with it there. Um, you can also do more than one, like you can animate more than one property at any keyframe point. So we can do like a transform, rotate uh, zero degrees, and then we'll come down here. And now our image should be spinning in circles while changing colors. Um, so maybe a little bit more dramatic than we want on these cards, but you can play with the filter. Um, you know, you can do, there's these huge rotates, but you can also kind of do like a grayscale. So maybe it's a, <laughs> let me turn that back off. Uh, you know, maybe it's a little, um, do some, some grayscale. And then when they hover over the card, it 
the color comes back in. Uh, so you can kind of have a lot of fun with those uh, different filters and adding these different properties together to kind of have a party. Um, so the last one is basically looking at what Rebecca did on her card, uh, which I thought was pretty fun. Um, somewhere in here, there we go. Uh, where it does this like rotate, like it flips the card. Um, so definitely think you should check out her code there and see, um, uh, I think I had it up somewhere, but I lost it. Uh, Yes, code. Um, it looks like Rebecca was using transforms, um, but this could definitely be, uh, you know, refactored to be using keyframe animations so that you're kind of putting all the different pieces together. Um, I thought it would be fun. You could probably write this where, you know, the the front of the card goes through the keyframe steps forward and the back of the card goes through them backwards. So you don't have to write two different uh, keyframes, you can just use the code you already have to kind of have it go in alternating directions. Um, so something like that could be fun to play with and using this as a, a starting point, because um, that was pretty fun uh, to see. Um, so yeah, uh, I've also seen a lot of times you can add uh, animation to buttons, and I don't have any code on this one yet, but um, playing with like the box shadow and moving the box shadow to like an inset instead so that when you click the button, it looks like it's actually like a physical button being pressed down. Um, so things like that. I know a lot of the buttons have like when you hover over them, it just jumps to a different color, um, making that more of an animation so that it doesn't happen right away. Uh, like this one has these fun lines that go across. Um, but just kind of adding some sort of animation on your buttons, whether it's the color changing or like getting a little bit bigger because they're hovering over it, things like that to draw attention to it um, are all things that might be fun. So yeah, uh, hope to see you guys join uh, the Hacktober event and try some of these things. Uh, I'll be in Slack all month. So if you're trying them or want to bug me about animation code, uh, I'm totally down to help figure any of that out. Uh, and I think time for questions. Yeah, I didn't run to right to the end this time. <laughs> Feel free to unmute and ask a question, or if you prefer, you can put it in chat and um, one of us will read it out loud. We did have some people ask about how they could get in touch with you, Jordan. Uh, not my 